a car crash. You just need to get here. And a crushed skull. I couldn't even recognize my son. Two parents watched their son cling to life. It wasn't Luke's destiny to die at 25. And they resolved to save it. Now it's time to get to work. Watch what happens next. The first word that comes in your mind is like miraculous. On today's 700 Club. Hey, welcome, folks. We've got a lot of stuff going on today. By the way, I'm saddened. Uh, one of the great golfers, Arnold Palmer, who was just a legend, he was so friendly, and he brought golf to the masses. Arnold Palmer died at 87. We're sad to see that. We, I watched uh, Roy McElroy. He had a putt, one putt that was worth $9 million. The game has oh. so grown. Well, over he, the he years. won the it's tour amazing. championship, and that in turn put him in charge of uh, winning the FedEx Cup, so it's something. So, all right. I'm going to ask you a question. Are you ready? Well, probably not, but go for it. <laughs> what substance has been discovered that is 5,000 more effective in, uh, in dealing with free radicals and vitamin C? Do you know? I don't know. I asked our wonderful Laurie Johnson if she would give us a report on it. And if you'll stay tuned, you will learn what this magic stuff is, and you can get it at a health food store. It is simply amazing. So I guess I'll stay here for a little bit. Please. <laughs> that was a tease. I did want you to tune off. All right. Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton finally meet face to face tonight in the first presidential debate. And the stakes couldn't be higher. Many voters will say they make up their minds based on the debate. A potential audience of 100 million people. Unbelievable. Well, tonight's debate comes just six weeks before the election, with the race essentially tied at this point. One million people expected to watch. We have two reports from CBN News, beginning with our political correspondent, David Brody. It's a presidential debate that can be summed up in one familiar word. You! As the construction crews put the finishing touches on the debate stage, Americans are expected to tune in for likely historic TV ratings. Brady took a shot. Michael Bennett levels him. The 2015 Super Bowl clocks in at number one with 115 million viewers. The 1983 series finale of MASH brought in 106 million. One poll estimates tonight's event could rival those numbers, topping 100 million. Regardless of the count, it will be must-see TV. Trump tells CBN News his simple goal for tonight's epic encounter. What do you want to accomplish in these debates specifically against her? Win. That's all I want to do. I want to win. But for this outsider, winning won't be the result of traditional textbook strategy, like not pouring through big briefing books. Instead, he's expected to stick with what got him here, instinct and boldness. Trump, however, will need to pass the plausibility test. That is, whether voters see him as a president. Many are evangelical, still trying to decide whether they pull the lever for Trump or possibly sit this election out. Evangelical leader David Barton calls that the wrong approach. We have a very selfish view of what we do with voting. And I say that in the sense of most Christians think that voting is a is a right. It's not. It's a duty. And Trump's been rallying the troops in the days leading up to this debate. I'm running to be the voice of the forgotten men and women of this country. It's appropriate that this first attention-grabbing debate will be in the New York area. Both candidates feel right at home in this familiar territory. Trump Tower located in Manhattan. Hillary Clinton's headquarters are 20 minutes away in Brooklyn. And the debate site at Hofstra University in Hempstead, New York, is only about an hour drive without traffic. As he has proven before, Donald Trump likes to get a bit feisty in these debates, mix it up a little bit. But remember, he typically doesn't throw the first punch. He waits until he's attacked. And then, of course, analysts say, indeed, he is one of the best counter punchers out there. So exactly how will Hillary Clinton respond on stage? More on that as we head 20 minutes cross town to Jenna Browder, my colleague standing by with more on the Clinton campaign strategy. Jenna. Thanks, David. Well, behind me, the Brooklyn Bridge. Drive five minutes across this iconic landmark and you land at Clinton headquarters where they are preparing for just about anything. 
How do you prepare for a debate with Donald Trump? Well, I'm I, here I, to ask for your help. Oh. <laughs> it's a good question. You've got to be prepared for, like, wacky stuff that comes at you. Yeah. And I, I am drawing on my experience in elementary school. And all kidding aside, one Hillary Clinton takes very seriously. Great the Democratic debate. nominee one, cut back campaigning last debates. week. Sources say she's going through briefing books, rehearsing, and studying clips of Donald Trump from the Republican primary debate taking notes of his style and what gets under his skin. One advisor telling CBN News Clinton isn't underestimating Trump. I run across people, partisans and nonpartisans alike, who, you know, they'll say, you know, what are you so worried about? Why are y'all working so hard? I mean, your girl's going to be the next president. Which my comment is, and I'm from Mississippi, not France, but my comment is, au contraire, mm. you know, we have a very, very tough race ahead of us, mm. and we've got two candidates, and we have two candidates' families that know how to win at the rodeo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a tough race for both sides, and they're going to go at it. Clinton has participated in more debates than any presidential candidate in recent history. But it's hard to say how much that experience will help with an unconventional outsider like Trump. Clinton is preparing to face some uncomfortable subjects from her email scandal to Bill Clinton's infidelity. A campaign insider says her team hopes to come up with a memorable one-liner that will knock Trump off his game and stick in voters' minds. Of course, one of the things to watch for for Clinton is how she reacts to Trump's attacks. In the past, she's been known to get agitated quickly, and so keeping a calm, cool demeanor will be critical in this debate of the ages. Reporting in New York, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Isn't it amazing that we settle a, the decision as to who's going to be the leader of our nation on the fact that they smirk or they cough or they drink water or they uh, slouch a little bit, or they forget a, a, what Aleppo is, or some silly thing like that. I mean, it's crazy what we decide uh, instead of doing an analysis of the capabilities, the strengths, and the weaknesses. And we think that we can look at them and on the basis of a debate and uh, that's led by the, I made ahead by a, a reporter for one of the networks that this is going to determine. But that's the way it is, and. Uh, what did they say about Al Gore? He reminded you of, uh, you know, your ex-mother-in-law. And I mean, all he's got to do is smirk one time and you're dead. So anyhow, uh, they're, they're practicing all that if they practice right. But, but Trump's not, I don't think, practicing any of it. He just said, look, I'm going to wing it and it's going to be fine. Well, I understand that you know, the people arrested in Charlotte, 70 percent have been from out of the city. In other words, this was a put-up thing. North Carolina is in play in terms of the, Congre uh, the presidential race. Very tight. Trump, I think, is a little bit ahead now, but Hillary was ahead, but they're neck and neck. So to set up this explosion in Charlotte and bust all these people in from out of the city, and then have a big riot in the city. You've got a black police chief, you've got a black policeman, you've got a black victim, and they start talking about white and black. It had nothing to do with white. It, it had to do with good or bad law enforcement. Well, race relations and the police have become a top issue uh, after the uh, uh, Tulsa and Charlotte incidents. And John Jessup has that story. Thanks, Pat. The mayor of Charlotte has lifted a curfew after days of violent protests. And as George Thomas reports, even though the police have put out some video of the shooting, there are growing calls for the department to, re to release the rest of the videos as well. With curfew lifted, the prayers and protests still continue in Charlotte. On Sunday, demonstrators and police peacefully faced off before a Panthers-Vikings game at the Bank of America Stadium. Yes, we support our team, but we support our lives as well. After days of intense public pressure, police released two videos showing the deadly confrontation between 43-year-old Keith Lamont Scott and Charlotte police officers. In this dash cam video, you see Scott get out of his car slowly, taking steps backwards with his hands at his side. 
Then four shots are fired. We got shots fired, one suspect down. A body camera video shows a different angle. A police officer tries to break Scott's passenger window with his baton. When that fails, he comes around the vehicle. That's when you see Scott visible for a brief second. Moments later, the father of seven is lying on the ground. Police rushed to him, guns drawn. Despite the videos, questions remain about whether Scott had a weapon. There's no single piece of evidence that proves all the complexities involved in this investigative process. His family insists he didn't have a gun and was in the car just reading a book. It does not make sense to us how it was possible that this incident resulted in the loss of life. Neither videos show Scott pointing a gun at officers. What I see on the video is the failure of the police to use all of the resources that they had at their disposal to avoid killing Keith. Police also released this image of a loaded gun that they say had Scott's blood and fingerprints, along with an ankle holster reportedly recovered at the scene. Neither the pictures nor the videos have done much to stop the protests. In fact, pressure is now growing on police to release the rest of the dash cam and body cam videos of Scott's shooting. George Thomas, CBN News. Thanks, George. Pat, back to you. I'm so tired of these ginned up uh, explosions that take place. And by the way, there was no demonstration in Tulsa at all. Why not? Well, they don't have a presidential race that they're concerned about in Oklahoma. So you don't have to bust in a whole lot of people from out of town to, to put up a riot. But in Charlotte and North Carolina, they do. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, insane. And there's a manipulative factor going on. These radicals think they can manipulate. But the police played right into that. I mean, to shoot that guy was stupid. They could have tasered him. They could have done a hundred different things to immobilize him without taking a weapon and shooting him dead. They didn't have to do that. But they did. So people are mad. They've got every right to be. But we certainly don't need to be playing into a group of radicals that want to turn North Carolina into some kind of a war zone. We don't need that. Well, at the beginning of this program, I told you about a revolutionary substance that they claim is 5,000 times more effective in getting rid of free radicals than vitamin C. Amazing. We ask our health reporter to check it out. John, tell us about it. That's right, Pat. Turning to health news, researchers have found that a new vitamin-like compound can lead to improved memory and other brain functions. Lori Johnson tells us about the benefits of something called PQQ. Parsley, green peppers, kiwi, papaya, tofu, and green tea. They all contain small amounts of the vitamin-like compound known as pyroquinoline quinone, or PQQ for short. Scientists say it helps our cells carry out their basic functions. Based on the premise that small amounts of PQQ in food promote overall health, scientists discovered that even higher doses in supplement form led to even greater benefits. Dr. Michael Murray says PQQ can be especially helpful for people who are suffering from some typical symptoms of aging, a drop-off in their memories and thinking skills. There is sufficient evidence right now showing efficacy and safety for a number of different applications, particularly improving memory and mental functions. And of course, uh, this is a relatively new substance, so there's going to be a growing body of scientific research. PQQ acts on the mitochondria in cells. Those mitochondria are responsible for producing energy that helps fuel the brain. So if the mitochondria are not functioning up to par, that brain is going to be a little bit dim. So we want to turn that dimmer switch, which is largely related to the activity of the mitochondria, to full strength. And that's what PQQ is able to do. Murray says PQQ is 5,000 times more effective than vitamin C at fighting diseases caused by free radicals. 
People over 40 who took 20 milligrams of PQQ a day found that their minds worked better, and even more so when they combined it with 300 milligrams of the nutrient CoQ10. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Thanks, Lori. Pat, those are some pretty amazing results. They are. I, I've read that stuff. I said, you know, this can't be true, Lori. Will you check it out? And she checked it out and came back yeah. with, yes, it's true. I'm on it. You I mean, I'm not it, on it yet, but I will be on it. You can get it at the <laughs> vitamin store. Yes, isn't that wonderful? And do I take it? Of course. Of course you do. Of course. <laughs> I could have told you that. How can I possibly <laughs> remember all the stuff I have to remember here? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't forget a thing. <laughs> okay, that's the elephant. Okay, what's well, next? Up next, not everyone is overjoyed with the lower prices at the pump. See how the low price of oil has left thousands of workers in Alaska jobless. Well, the people in Alaska have a bonanza because they actually get a piece of the revenue the state gets from its oil revenue. Well, that state has run on oil, and uh, Sarah Palin, of course, was an example. She was governor at one time of Alaska, and they were doing very well. And that uh, industry, oil, which you remember the North Slope and all that stuff that comes out of there, uh, makes up 90 percent of the state's budget of Alaska. And its jobs pay two and a half times higher than any other. Now, thanks to almost a year of low oil prices, Alaska's money-making industry appears to be drying up. Caitlin Burke went to the North Country to give us this report. Americans hit the road in droves this summer thanks to lower prices at the pump. But that relief comes with a cost. A worldwide surplus of crude oil is forcing American energy producers to shut down projects and lay off workers. Our members started seeing in 2015 that we were going to come to a point of very low oil prices. And so they started um, restructuring a little bit and looking for efficiencies in their businesses and started kind of, they started doing reductions in services. Then they looked at reductions in benefits and wages and then they hit the point probably about six months ago of layoffs, significant layoffs. Economists in oil-rich Alaska predict the loss of more than 2,000 good-paying jobs by the end of the year. When you've laid off that many people in the highest-paying jobs in the state, right, the average salary is $135,000 a year, there aren't opportunities here yet. I mean, they will come back, but they're just not available right now. As a well-service technician on the North Slope, Bronze Salmon made a good living. All I had to do was show up at work, do my job for two weeks, and then come home no phone calls, no email, undivided attention provided me time to uh, go out on field trips with the kids, volunteer at the school. He's been out of work since February. Salmon's wife Jody works at Talkeetna Elementary School, and summer break meant no paychecks. Thankfully, students are back, and so is the family's sole source of income. I mean, we're making it. <laughs> we're paying the bills and. Uh, the kids are eating, and so uh, we have a local food bank that helps out uh, families, so, and they've helped us out, which is great. And then uh, we volunteer when we can to go help them out. Salmon saw the warning signs when his company didn't hire the usual number of workers for the winter season, but he was assured his job was safe. December, BP came out and made an announcement that uh, all the work on the books was still supposed to go as scheduled, that there would be no more reason to lay anybody off. Everything was going to be fine come the first of the year. And then, of course, the first of the year came out and they announced that they were cutting back most of the programs. They were laying down rigs. And then in late February, that's when I got laid off with about 180, 200 people total. After working the slopes for the last eight years, Salmon knows the volatility of the oil industry, changing jobs three times because of various slowdowns. Now he may have to start over as job prospects look worse than he's ever seen. There's such a large number of applicants to every job. I, I mean, I've applied consistently, but I'm going to be 50 this year 
And I know that plays, even though it's not supposed to, I know that plays into HR when they're looking at someone that's going to be doing uh, work on the slope. Experts like Rebecca Logan with the Alaska Support Industry Alliance say oil jobs are slowly coming back, but they haven't yet reached Alaska. It's always challenging here <laughs> because we have... Um, we have such a challenging environment to work in, and so for companies to invest here, they need to have a higher price of oil than they would in other areas. For me, I'm at the point where we have to consider, is this really something that we wanna try and stick with and do it again, or do I do something different? Salmon fills his time with projects around the house. Keeps your mind off the reality of what's going on or what's not happening in that part of your life. And I tend to try to focus on what am I doing today? And, but when I'm paying bills, that's the hard part. Salmon is worried oil companies will continue to lay off seasoned and experienced workers, hiring younger workers at lower pay and drastically increasing the accident rate. I wouldn't recommend anyone go to do it, honestly, at this point. If they were telling me they had other options, I would say, well, I would go with the other options. A decision forced upon Salmon and thousands of other workers. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Talkeetna, Alaska. Amazing story of boom and bust. Uh, Alaska's been pretty prominent about the fact that they've taken that money and put it in reserves. Uh, but still, uh, they've paid a lot of it out to the people, and it's been very booming for them. But, you know, they built a pipeline up there to get that North Sioux uh, oil down uh, to the lower 48, as they call it. Uh, but the, uh, the prices where they were paying workers in that thing were just insane. I mean, the steel workers were just getting, making a fortune. People would go to work up there and get tens of thousands of dollars of, of income. And it was a real honeypot for the longest kind of time. They finally got that project in. They see it was an amazing engineering feat to bring that oil down from the uh, fields of that north slope. But uh, anyhow, that's the way it goes. But I think the prices will come back up. The Saudis are starting to hurt big time. And if they do, all they've got to do is just shut the taps a little bit and the prices will come back up. Terry? Well, you wish those families the best up oh, there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Coming up, a mom walks into a hospital room and doesn't even recognize her own son. I looked at him. I knew it was bad. His head was swollen. His eyes were shut. Tubes everywhere. Watch how this mom and dad launch a nationwide prayer campaign to save their son. Well, Superbook is bringing the stories of the Bible to children all over the world. And that's why we want to encourage you to join the Superbook DVD Club for your recurring gift of just $25 on a credit or a debit card. When you join, we're going to send you three copies of the latest Superbook DVD. You get one for yourself and two to give away. It's Elisha and the Syrians. And then every other month when you're part of the club, you'll be the first to receive each new episode that comes out. How do you join? You call 1-800-700-7000 or you can log on to CBN.com and just join the Superbook Club. We'll send you three copies of Elisha and the Syrians. And remember that DVD Club members also receive free streaming of all of season one and season two episodes. So join today. This series is changing the lives of children around the world, but also right here at home. You don't want your kids to miss out on it. So there's the number, 1-800-700-7000 or log on to CBN.com. Pretty special. Uh, are you going to watch the debate? Yes, I am. I, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think it was Jimmy Carter and Jerry Gerald Ford, if I'm not mistaken. And I, it was so boring. I looked around my, my living room. My daughter-in-law was there. My wife was there. They were both sound asleep. And uh, I said, boy, if they could package this and sell it as a sleep aid, uh, they'd make a fortune. It was it's so not too late. It was so boring. I don't think this is going to be boring at all. I don't think Donald it's Trump be boring is either. not boring. But anyhow, okay. Well, Luke Bernard was in a coma after a car crash that broke his back and his neck. He also sustained a traumatic brain injury. Doctors held little hope for Luke's survival and no hope that he would ever live a normal life. But Luke's family 
said, we're not going to believe the report of the doctors. We're going to believe the report of the Lord. This image that I, in order to be right with God and loved by God, I had to be this perfect Christian. Luke Bernard grew up in a Christian home, but by age 25, decided he couldn't be the person he thought he should be. So he tried being someone else. I would drink. I ended up drinking a lot consistently. On March 9th, 2013, Luke remembers only what he's been told. After having a couple of drinks with friends, Luke was driving home alone when he lost control of his car. He was flown to Los Angeles County Medical Center in critical condition. They just said, Mr. Bernard, you just need to come. You just need to get here. We can't promise you anything. Luke's father, Daniel, was in Houston on business when he got the call and took the next flight to LA. His wife, Kathy, arrived at the hospital from their home in Florida. When I walked into the room, I looked at him. I knew it was bad. I mean, I couldn't even recognize my son. His head was swollen, his eyes were shut, and they were all bruised and tubes everywhere. Here's the situation, which is really, really bad. Now it's time to get to work. And that meant prayer. Luke was in a coma with little hope for survival. The family was told if he did live, he'd be in a vegetative state or seriously disabled due to a traumatic brain injury. He had also broken his back and neck. But Luke's family refused to believe the prognosis. With all of our hearts, we believe that it wasn't Luke's destiny to die at 25. We just knew that. And so we said, we're going to pray desperate, specific, unified prayers for him. And we got everyone to pray. There was thousands of people praying. We said, this is how we want you guys to pray. Luke's parents stayed at his bedside reading scripture and praying. 11 days later, he woke up. When he woke up, I was there beside him and Daniel said, if you recognize your mom, squeeze my hand. And he did. He was moved out of critical care and placed in rehab. But Luke was still in a back brace and doctors didn't know whether he'd walk again. He started moving his legs and we were like, wait a minute. I mean, and, and he was showing us. He'd pick him up, move him, pick him up, move him. And I'm going like, okay. We called the doctors and said, look. And they said, that's really good because that's a voluntary movement. So more x-rays were ordered. And they kept on saying stable. And I was like, well, what does stable mean? It means we can't find the brakes anymore. Less than a month after the accident, Luke was able to leave the hospital and return to Florida with his parents. He wore a helmet until surgery could be performed to replace a piece of his skull. Little by little, Luke began forming new memories from what others told him. The realization of, okay, something rare happened here. Luke's medical records show that he arrived at the emergency room with a Glasgow coma scale of three, the worst possible score. No one knew if Luke would fully recover, not even neurosurgeon Dr. Peter Gruen. Somebody like Mr. Bernard, who comes in with a Glasgow coma score of three, and then a few months later is walking into my brain injury clinic, I could count those on one hand. So very, very, very uncommon. And I, I, I hesitate to say the word, but I, you know, it, it, it is almost, when you see it, the first word that comes in your mind is like miraculous. All I know is that people were praying for me. That led Luke to ask more questions. Why God? Why me? Thinking that I had to be this perfect Christian to be right with God. Then he realized something. You can't be a certain way to earn God's love because you already have it. It's a gift from God. He loves you and he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you because he loves you. 
and he wants to spend eternity with you. Luke now read the Bible with fresh eyes and recommitted his life to Jesus Christ. It felt like a burden was taken off of me. He worked daily in rehab to recover from the brain injury. One morning, he awoke from a dream and began writing a screenplay. I ended up finishing writing the script in one month. And six months before, I was in rehab, relearning how to write my name. It's called The Favorite. Luke is in development for his film about two brothers portraying Luke's spiritual and physical healing. Sometimes I'd tell Luke, I said, Luke, you're a miracle. God's goodness and faithfulness is everlasting. Maybe God wants me, wants to use me for something. I don't necessarily know what the, the end result is going to be, but I'm like, nah, I don't need to. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just wait and listen and just <laughs> respond to where I believe he's leading and directing me. I just wait and listen to what he's got for me. Isn't that a beautiful story? The doctors couldn't do it. Who? That's humanly impossible. But look, God, all he's got to do is just whisper the word, and, and you can be healed. You know, like the man said, just speak the word, and my servant will be healed. So all you got to do is say it. If God speaks it, all things are possible. Now, we've got to, some prayer requests, some prayer answers, and then we want to pray for you. Here's one. Uh, June, who lived in Columbia, South Carolina, was dealing with severe pain in her ring finger. Became so stiff she could not bend her finger. And one day she was watching this program. Terry, you said someone with uh, tremendous joint pain, God is healing you. You're going to feel warm and it's going to be uh, okay. And June said, I know that Terry is speaking to me. And the pain instantly disappeared. What else you got? Well, this is Sally. She lives in Costa Mesa, California. She mm -hmm. suffered with a mitral valve prolapse. Yeah. She was watching this program one day. Pat, you had a word of knowledge that someone was being healed of this condition. And when Sally returned to her doctor, he said the condition was no longer there. That is a valve in the heart that deals with the flow of blood. And that mitral valve collapses and the blood isn't properly and you don't have enough energy. And all of a sudden, God just healed that. Yeah. Now, that's a miracle. a miracle. Now, we're going to join hands, ladies and gentlemen. I'll ask you to join with us. We're going to pray for you. Now, why don't you receive it? Don't fight it. Just say, thank you, Lord. The Bible says, Abraham, amen to God, and God counted it to him for righteousness. God said, I'm going to give you all this. And Abraham said, amen. I take it. And God said, okay, that's righteous. Father, I join with my sister in Christ. And we pray together for those in this audience. Lord, there are people suffering. You know you've heard their cries. But somebody's got a, a foot thing. It's, it's like you cut the arch of your foot. Mm -hmm. And they may have stepped on a piece of metal or glass or something. But God has just healed it. The, 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 you'll see amazing healing right now. There. There's someone else. You've had a fall that's really thrown your back out of whack. And... Uh, nothing you take seems to help at all. God's healing that for you right now. Just receive it. Thank you, Lord. Thank, Thank you, Lord. You, Lord. Uh, th there's a uh, uh, contusion. You've got a, a swelling, and it's kind of like a big blister. And if you put your hand on it, it's going to go down right now, and all that blood is going to get back where it's supposed to, and you're going to be completely healed in the name of Jesus. A hematoma, I think, is the word. It is all healed, yes. And someone else, you have a condition with your eye. It's like the very rim, top and bottom, gets red, and there's a crustiness that comes from it, but it's very irritating. God's healing that for you right now in Jesus' name. Wherever you are, in Jesus' name, receive an answer. Thank you, Lord. And while we're praying, Lord, we pray for this nation. We, so many people are asking for this nation. There's a debate. We've got to pick a leader, but we've got to pick a course of action. This nation is at the crossroads, and we ask, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you might bring revival to America. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. Terry.
Well, nearly 90,000 people have joined with us to pray for our nation. If you're not already praying for America with us, it's not too late to be a part of that. Call our toll-free number. It's 1-800-700-7000 or log on to PrayForAmerica.com. We want you to be a part of it. We need to all be unified together, asking God to bless this nation and to turn us, turn us back to Him. Well, still ahead, a drunk driver crashes his car and a policeman gives him a spiritual summons. He said to me, I'm not going to write you all these tickets, but you know what? You need Jesus. And I said to myself, uh, you're right. You know, you're right. I do need Jesus. See how this man loses all desire to drink after 25 years of alcoholism. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Authorities in Washington state have yet to determine the motive of the shooter who killed five people in a mall Friday night. 20-year-old Arkan Satin faces five counts of first-degree murder. Satin is an immigrant from Turkey with permanent resident status in the U.S. Police say there's no evidence of terrorism, but they haven't ruled it out. Meanwhile, churches in the Burlington, Washington area are working to offer emotional support for people in that town. They're holding prayer services, hosting counselors, and just offering a safe space to gather. CBN Superbook has made its way into schools in Wales. CBN has partnered with Sporting Marvels, a Welsh team that tells students about Jesus. Since January of 2015, students have been using curriculum with Superbook's design and content. It's taught in 17 schools. It covers Old and New Testament heroes, as well as tells you how to live a Christian life. Thanks to Superbook, 2,000 children have been taught, and over 1,000 children's Bibles have been handed out to build each child's faith in God. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com slash international. Pat and Terry will be back right after this. To see this week's top on-demand videos, go to CBN.com. Well, as a boy, Wayne Hardy vowed he would never be like his father. But that's exactly how he turned out. Then after 25 years of drinking, Wayne got behind the wheel of a car and crashed into a ditch. Wayne Hardy was raised by an abusive, alcoholic father. The worst beating I remember is, I believe that I was maybe seven years old. It came with the drinking. Wayne's mother got the worst of the abuse. My mother be bleeding and um, things be broken, thrown over in the house. At times he would beat her down and drag her. When Wayne was a teen, his father abandoned the family and Wayne became the man of the house. At first, the responsibility came as a relief. I felt like I was important. Over all the years of seeing him abuse her, you know, I was able to help stop him from doing that. But eventually, Wayne's resentment towards his father and his newfound freedom led to darker things. He soon dropped out of school and joined a gang. We went out and robbed people and broke in people's houses. I became more of a violent person than of this uh, nice person that I used to be. Before long, Wayne was addicted to the exact same substances that ruined his childhood and his family. At first, it, it was fun. It, 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 you know, partying all the time was fun. And it wasn't, uh, the, you know, the hard stuff. It got to the point where it wasn't uh, strong enough for me. So we went to, to the hard stuff, uh, drinking alcohol, uh, whiskey. I got addicted to it and, and at, to the point where when I wanted to stop, I couldn't. I'm drinking to feel better, but you end up feeling miserable. Wayne was even abusive to his girlfriends. I saw what my father did. I saw him, how he treated my mother, and that stuck with me. And I took that trade on. By his 30s, he was drinking a fifth of whiskey a day, and his driver's license had been revoked for almost a decade. But Wayne says a near-fatal drunk driving accident in the pouring rain actually saved his life. The van flipped into the ditch, and as it flipped into the ditch, because I think I was doing like 75 or 80, and when it flipped into the ditch, it just slid on the side. And as it came to a stop, I, I come out the driver's side of the window. 
Wayne was able to escape the accident unharmed, and eyewitnesses called the police for help. And then I saw the state police come. I know I'm gonna be doing some time. My mouth made up that I'm gonna be doing some time. And even as uh, the police officer asked me to step over to his vehicle, um, I just put my hands behind my back. He had to roll me out like, these were about seven or eight tickets. And uh, when I told him all these things that I'm, I'm, you know, I know I'm going to jail and I know I'm going to be there for a long time, he said to me, um, you know, I'm not going to write you all these tickets, but you know what? You need Jesus. And when he spoke that to me and I looked over at him, it's like something just left out of me and I felt a relief at where peace came over me when he said that. I'm sorry. And I said to myself, uh, you're right. You know, you're right, I do need Jesus. Two weeks later, Wayne went to church and went forward for prayer at the end of service. I finally got there to the preacher and he, he, he asked me, he said, what do, you, what do you want from the Lord? And I kind of whispered in my voice and, uh, you know, said, I want to know Jesus. The next morning, Wayne says he felt his desire for alcohol begin to disappear. And the Lord spoke to me and told me, he said, uh, every time you want this drink, I want you to read my word. I, I went to the Bible 16, 17 times. Every time I wanted that drink, after three days of doing what God told me to do, I didn't have that desire no more for the alcohol. It was gone. Uh, 25 years of being an alcoholic, I did not have the desire to drink no more. Wayne says that his life began to transform in ways he couldn't even imagine. He says it was not only a fresh start for him, but for his entire family. He married his longtime girlfriend, Sandra, and they have a healthy, respectful marriage and children who love God. To know God is, is a new life. To know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is a new life because you're a whole different person. He can help someone else. He can heal someone. He can deliver someone. He can set someone free. I know that what God has done for me, He can do for somebody else. That's the message. What God did for him, He can do for you. Folks, if you don't know the Lord, not that cop said, you don't need tickets, you need Jesus. We need Jesus. And it's so easy. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so right now, I'm just asking you, call upon the name of the Lord. I won't lead you in any prayer or anything. You can do it yourself. Just say, Lord, I'm a sinner. And I know you died for sinners. And I know you died for me. And let him come. He can transform you. You're an alcoholic of many, many years, set free instantly. The power of God is beyond anything we can comprehend. Now, for those who need further help, we've got something called a new day. It it's, uh, tells you about what happens when you find the Lord. So please call, and I'll give you this if you want the little, but say, I, I want Jesus. Just call like Wayne said to that preacher. Say, what do you want? I want Jesus. The number's there. It's 707,000. That's easy to remember. It's 1 800 707,000. Okay. Well, Terry, what's next? Well, next we're going to bring it on. Susan writes and says, Why are we praying for America only? Shouldn't we be praying God's pe for God's people all over the world? Well, stay tuned. Pat's going to tackle that one and lots more. We'll be back after this. Regent University, folks, it's the fastest growing university in America. It's just simply amazing what's there. 44 of our graduates have become judges. One just was put on the Supreme Court of the state. Uh, lots of good things are happening. 800 or so teachers of the year came out of Regent when over 300, 400, I think, are teaching in uh, various colleges. Uh, there are seven or eight of the uh, graduates or presidents of colleges and two or three or chancellors of universities. I mean, it's just simply amazing. So there's a preview coming up on Regent. You can, you can get involved. It's October 8th, so it's just a little while from now. And there's the number, 757-352-4902. And it's on your screen, or you can log on to Regent EDU and ask about the fall preview. It's graduate and undergraduate. We've got financial aid and all kinds of good stuff. So, all right. the, we always talk about leadership to change the world, and one of the other wonderful things about Regent is the international influence because you have so many students here from around the world, all really. around the world. They, they, very they exciting. They represent about 30, no, I, I'm trying to think. We've got about 30, 
uh, I, I've lost the number, uh, but th there are about at least 30 nations represented. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, right. wonderful school. Okay. okay, time to bring it on. You yeah. ready for this? Uh, let's go. This is Susan who says, why are we praying for America only? As true Christians, shouldn't we be praying for God's people all over the world? I really believe that Jesus wants us to pray for all his people. Well, isn't that sweet? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I just think that's so tender. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That might have made my money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, who do you pray for? Do you pray for all the little children in your city? Or you pray for your own kids. I mean, who do you pray for? You pray for Molly and Charlie and Susan, who are your children. Then you pray for your grandchildren. You pray for your family. And right now, America's our family. That's who you're, you're, and the Chinese can pray for the Chinese, but you can, of course, pray for God's work all over the world. But I mean, that, that. Yeah, it's not an either or. It's no, of course and not. also, right? All right. <laughs> Sorry, you threw me on that one. Okay, this next one is from Diane, who says, every year I let my teenage son go with friends to a Halloween event at a local theme park. I just learned that they have a haunted house based on Satan and demons. Apparently there are girls and suggestive demon outfits, selling drinks, techno music, and even a demon DJ who encourages people to dance. I know my son is a good boy and he will be disappointed if I don't let him go. How can I make him understand that keeping him away is the best thing for him? Well, you've got to tell him the truth. I mean, explain to him who the devil is. Explain to him the devil wants to destroy you. The devil, you know, seeks who he may devour. He's out to kill you. Yeah. And he's going to put everything nice in your way that's going to seem like fun. There's pleasure in sin for a season. But the answer is, mother, don't let your babies grow up to be demon worshipers, if I can quote from Willie Nelson. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't let them do it. I mean, you know, that's just the way it is. And you say, look, no, I'm sorry. Or better than that, there needs to be alternative Halloween celebrations in churches where they have all the games and all the fun and all the nice pretty girls and all the handsome boys and all that. They all come together and they're praising the Lord instead of worshiping Satan. But Halloween has become a night when the devil rejoices. All right. Okay, this is Matthew who says, I need to know how I should spend time alone with the Lord. When I do, I find myself taking half of the day with him. So is the best way to spend the day with him early in the morning? Well, the Bible says, early will I seek thee, but you can pray morning, noon, and night. Uh, you know, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's there all the time. So uh, there are no rules. I mean, do what is, is right with you when your heart is crying out to the Lord. Uh, daily will I seek him. I mean, you know, that's, the Bible is full of people who pray, and they pray all the time. Pray constantly. Pray without ceasing, the Bible says. All right? This next one is unbelievable. This is from Julie Pat, who says, my 12-year-old grandson has been, is being bullied at school for almost a year now. The latest incident was another student forcing his head into a toilet. The school has done little to nothing to resolve this. What can I do? My grandson is under my care. He and I both live in constant fear of what will happen next. Well, I... I don't want you to be one of these people who's always suing, but I tell you, I'd sue the school. You know what? The same thought came to me. Yeah. A good lawyer will go a long way. <laughs> Absolutely. And they'll begin to pay attention. But right now, you, you just want more voice yelling. The other thing is hire somebody to go along with him. Get, get some uh, strapping athlete to accompany him to sc school if you can afford the money. And before long, those bullies, it doesn't take but one tough guy to put the little bullies down. And they're just bluffers, but you, your son is in agony. I mean, he'll, he'll scar his life. Mm -hmm. The school is absolutely should be sued. Absolutely. Shocking, really. All right. This is Chris who says, are there rewards for tithing in this lifetime, or are they only for heaven? Well, it, it's here, certainly, uh, you know. See if I won't open the window of heaven and pour you out such a blessing you cannot contain it. That's right now. That isn't something for the future, but in the future, I think there are blessings. There are going to be rewards in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no question about that. Well, and we share stories all the time here of people who yeah. begin to tithe that haven't been before, and they see businesses turn around, Everything. personal debt. A tremendous uh, thing. But uh, the question is, is it going to happen in this life or the next life? It's going to happen in the next life, too. I, I think, you know, you know, the Bible talks about your righteousnesses will follow you, clothed with righteousnesses. Well, thanks for being with us. We leave you with today's Power Minute from Romans chapter 10. 
for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And tomorrow, how a meth addict suffered supernaturally and was freed from her addiction in an instant. So to Terry and Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson, and Lord willing, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.